uh, Pastor John's just God's digging down on us. Um, we have these uh, sessions. Bishop Morgan wants us to build men with character and integrity. And Pastor uh, 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 Soto started off yesterday, and man, he just put the shovel in and turned the door over. Amen. So um, he mentioned co covenant eyes. Was he mentioned that? I made a notation on it, and uh, I was talking to some guys. Um, I have several electronic devices, but I do not have one device that my wife does not know my passcode. She can pick my phone up anytime, go in my phone. She can pick my laptop anytime or my Mac anytime, put in my passcode, and, go and follow me throughout where I've been. I don't do that for her. I do that for me. I want to make sure that I hold myself accountable to my wife and my, my Mac at, my, at, the, at the job. People know how to get in there and they can go anywhere they want to go to see where I've been. So I want to hold myself accountable. I do remember one time I, my wife brought a uh, Victoria's Secrets magazine and told me to go through it and pick out some stuff. So I'm going to like, all right. That's like telling the alcoholic to go to the corner store. So, so I, I start perusing. Then I close the book, and I said to myself, don't be playing, man. Come on. So I said, honey, I love you, but you don't, don't get these no more. She said, didn't you see something you like? I goes like, that's the problem. <laughs> Every time I turn the page, you know, I... I wasn't looking on nothing to put on you. I'm looking at what's already got it on. I was like, I don't, I can't handle this. I can't handle this. <clears throat> I can't handle this. It's soft porn. I can't. I, if it's ice cream, whether it's soft ice cream, it's still ice cream, gentlemen. <laughs> just so, just, just so I'm, I'm transparent to you. So we have to make these covenants with our eyes and covenants with our wives, and then we have to make covenants with ourselves and then make covenants with God. Amen? So come on, preach just, sir. Praise the Lord. Would you do me a favor? Would you turn to four or five people, let them know you're happy to see them this morning? God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you again for the invitation. We are absolutely enjoying ourselves. I don't know how you feel about this weather, but I love it. And uh, I don't do hot very well. You know, you, you get to a certain weight, and uh, I'm, I've hit that weight and passed that weight, and you start sweating in the shower, man. It's like crazy. And uh, so this cool weather has been kind to me. And I've enjoyed the ministry of the word. My, my, my. Brother Bounds last night, what a message, what a challenge to our fellowship, to all of us. Amen. And then also Brother Derek Johns, one of my heroes. When I grow up, I want to be like that man. And, uh, you know, when you know the messenger, it really even makes the message that much more powerful. And uh, he is a champion of truth in so many different ways. And I love and respect both Brother Bounds and uh, Brother John's very much. I appreciate your bishop. He uh, has influenced my life. He doesn't know that, but he has. And uh, there's a difference between mentoring and influence. And uh, mentoring is like a small airplane. You can't put everybody on your airplane and get it off the ground. Mentoring is not telling people, have a nice flight. I believe in you. Uh, mentoring is a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's purposeful. It's time. And then there's this thing called influence, which is a beautiful thing, where a man can touch your life. He doesn't even know your name, but the impartation on your life because of his preaching and his character and, and his journey, it inspires you and gives you courage to go forward. And Brother Morgan is one of those men that 
uh, has, has definitely influenced my life. He preached revival when I was in Bible school in 1991, and I never forgot that, um, that revival. It, was, it made a huge impact on my life. So thank you so very much for the privilege. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It's a verse, I don't know if you've ever seen this before. It's kind of uh, unique. I just read it for the first time the other day, and uh, I thought I might just talk about this verse here. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Thank you for standing in honor of the word of the Lord. I want to help men today. I feel a burden for men who are going through some things. Maybe it's a marital issue. Maybe you're going through something in your church and you're experiencing divine subtraction and you're suffering and you're hurting. As a pastor, you don't have the luxury of being indifferent when people you love leave. Maybe there's a challenge in the workplace. Maybe you've lost a job. There's financial trouble and trial. I want to talk to you about finding power in your pain. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Can we just put our Bibles down and could we lift our hands and just stand in the presence of the Lord and invite him into this moment? Jesus, we honor you, we praise you, thank you for your word. It is forever settled in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you are the balm of Gilead. You heal us when we are wounded. Give us understanding. Help us to understand, Lord, the power that is in our pain. The purpose, Lord, that is in our trials. We don't want to be bitter men. We want to be better men, Lord. We want to stand strong, God, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I've come to preach to some men who have pain in their lives. Pain from something that you are going through presently or pain from things that are in your past. I'm talking about physical pain and I'm talking about emotional pain. For the believer, there is no pain without a purpose. We just read this. There is no pain without a purpose. It will work for good and sometimes we misquote this verse and we say, well, all things work together for your good. That's not what it says. It doesn't say it works together for your good. It says it works together for good. For good. And Paul informs us that all things, the good and the bad, can be used by God as raw material for greatness. God is not responsible for all the bad in your life. But he can use all the bad in your life for good. God is creative enough. God is powerful enough to take the worst thing in your life and repurpose that experience from painful to powerful. Now, this isn't just a, good, a feel-good message. We have Bible for this. There is theology behind this in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. If we could put that on the screen. Because this is really going to be the ground level understanding and insight for us. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. But he, referring to Jesus, was wounded for a purpose. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Aren't you thankful for that? And so when you come to God, when you bring your pain to God, God not only redeems your soul, God can redeem your pain. Your painful wounds can become powerful wounds. When you think about Jesus suffering, when you think about Jesus being brutalized by the Roman guards and, and they were experts at inflicting pain and torture, and Jesus' body is there and his flesh is hanging, uh, hanging from his frame. We see this man. We, we want to turn away. We don't even want to look at this man, this disfigured man. Disfigured from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. This man, his painful wounds have become powerful wounds. Do you, did you know that? 
the thorns that were pressed into his brow. These are wounds that were pressed there to heal our minds. And the disfigurement of Jesus' face when his beard was pulled from his face and his 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 face was bloodied. Jesus was wounded on his face to restore our identity. And Jesus was wounded on his back to bring spiritual and physical healing to us. He was wounded in his hands to heal us from every evil thing that we have ever participated in. And he was wounded in his feet to restore the authority and the dominion that we lost in our lives. There was purpose in Jesus' pain. There was purpose in his wounds and as a believer when I'm wounded as a believer when I have pain in my life there is purpose there and even my painful wounds become powerful wounds brothers don't waste your trial I want you to invite God into this painful season of your life now stop to think about this healing is not necessarily the absence of of pain. Sometimes healing is finding purpose and power in your pain. In fact, there was a man who made a statement, sometimes healing is embracing your pain and burning it as fuel for your journey. Well, Brother Soto, I don't want any of this. Would you please turn the page? Would you preach about something else? I don't want to feel pain. I don't know a man that really enjoys pain. In fact, we had a brother here. He asked if we would pray for him. He has pain in his lower back, and we prayed in the name of Jesus Christ. But you know, pain actually does serve a purpose. Dr. Paul Brand, a medical missionary, worked through the, uh, with lepers, and he saw the suffering that lepers went through. And he wrote a book entitled, The Gift of Pain. I read it a couple of years ago. It's an incredible read. I, re I definitely recommend it. Dr. Brand spent many years working with lepers in India, and he wrote that one of the problems with leprosy is that the leper can no longer feel pain in the diseased parts of their body. And he saw firsthand the problem of not feeling pain. He made this statement. He said, if I had the power to eliminate human pain, I would not exercise that right. Pain's value is too great. Now, Dr. Brand observed that when a healthy person has an injured leg, when you injure your leg, if you fracture your leg in a fall, you will immediately get up and you will start to limp. And what you are doing is you are sparing that leg the full weight of your body. But a leper doesn't feel the pain. When a leper injures his leg, he doesn't feel that pain. And because he doesn't feel the pain, he doesn't limp. And because he doesn't limp, he compounds the problem. And he wrote in his book about lepers who had bones protruding from their bodies. Because they wanted to get first in line in the food line and they had a crutch and they were told to use the crutch to spare that broken leg. But they just started running because they wanted to get to the front of the food line and they tremendously compounded the problem that they had in their body. Dr. Brand wrote in his book about a girl who was brought to him while he was visiting in the United States. She did not have leprosy, but she did have a rare genetic condition called congenital indifference to pain. The girl had a bandaged ankle, and, and Dr. Brand removed the bandage, and he saw that her, her ankle was turned the wrong way. And so he knelt down, and he went to work on that ankle. And he looked up as he was... I mean, really wrenching on this ankle to get it back where it needed to be. And he noticed that the girl was entirely indifferent to the whole thing. She was absolutely bored about the whole thing. And the mother of this girl told Dr. Brand about horrific stories where her daughter would severely injure herself. And she was completely unaware. And she didn't even care about her wounds. And within seven years of that first visit, that girl had lost both of her legs to amputation as well as most of her fingers. So this is what a life without pain will do to you. A life without pain will disfigure you. Painlessness is a nightmare. 
Dr. Brand himself recounted one night when after many years of working with lepers that he realized that he had no feeling in his foot. Nothing. No sensation whatsoever. And he wrote that it was the darkest night of his entire life. And all night he worried about this, what this moment meant to the rest of his life. And he knew better than anyone how leprosy advances in a body. Soon he would no longer be able to feel the sensation of a scalpel in his own hand. And he knew that his career as a surgeon was over. And at last, the morning came. And he decided that he would precisely map the progression of the disease in his own body. And so he took a pen and he jabbed his heel with that pen. And he let out a yell and it turned out that he did not have leprosy, but he had a sciatic nerve problem. And he had had temporarily had temporary numbness in his foot. And here he had diagnosed himself as a leper. All night long, he was grieving about having leprosy, but he didn't have it. And when he felt that pain, this is what he wrote. He said, never had I felt a sensation as delicious as that live electric jolt of pain. I breathed a prayer and thanked God for my pain. When's the last time you thank God? For your pain. Do you understand that the shallow version of you is not going to change the world? And the very thing that you're going through is adding to your ministry portfolio. And giving you a sensitivity and an empathy that you didn't have before there is value in having depth in your life there's value in having depth in your ministry and truly great people people of great purpose have depth and what are the tools that dredge out a life and bring depth to the life pain everybody say pain, pain. yes pain add depth to your life Pain adds capacity to your life. You will accomplish more in life because you experience pain than if you never experienced it. I don't know if you've ever met someone who's really shallow, someone who's never really gone through anything, and you realize maybe the best thing that could happen is a little bit of adversity for that individual. You're not wishing them ill. But you do understand that they probably need to go through a few things if they're truly going to be effective in their life. The greatest intellects, the greatest athletes, the greatest leaders, the greatest Christians, the greatest preachers have embraced God's hardest curriculum program that life has to offer the regimen of pain. Pain allows you and allows me to live my greatest life purpose. We need to stop pointing an accusing finger at God and being upset with him about the things that we're going through and saying, God, where are you? And when is my, when is it going to be my turn to have success? When is it going to be my turn to have revival? You just need to stay around long enough and don't cop an attitude with God. And for now, just thank God for your pain because it's going to bring wisdom and strength to your life and to your ministry. Amen. God knows that easy and happy experiences don't maximize you. They don't grow your faith. It's the storm. It's the painful season of life that grows you. And for this reason, pain is not an intrusion in your life. Pain is an imperative. And when we have God in our life, we don't go through pain. We grow through pain. All things work together for good to those who love God. So God wants to add depth and capacity to your life. But he can't accomplish that if you have an absolute intolerance for pain. Note takers, would you write this down? Sometimes the difference between where you are and where God wants you to be is the pain you are unwilling to endure. Let 
Many of you would know Brother Galoni down in SoCal. And I had the privilege to preach uh, a, a convention down there a couple of years ago. And uh, a, a former Navy SEAL. Wow. Bad to the bone. A former Navy SEAL. And I wanted him to tell me the story. And he drove me around and showed me the sights. And, and as you know, that, that, that Navy SEAL designation on a man. That, that, is, that man has a man car. And I asked him about his experience, and his story was riveting to me, and he told me that when he walked into the Navy SEAL training center, there was a sign at the door that said, your easiest day was yesterday. <laughs> your easiest day was yesterday. And, and he told me about the, the most difficult week of training for a Navy SEAL. It's famously known as Hell Week. Hell week. It's a week of extreme physical and mental testing. It's designed to weed out anybody from the program who has even a speck of an inclination to quit, panic, or not be a team player. And the recruits are made to lie in ice-cold waters of the ocean for hours. And they're made to run grueling obstacle courses and perform depleting drills in dangerous waters with a rubber raft with little to no sleep. And they're pushed past their limits. Past their limits. And many recruits break in the process. And Brother Galoni told me that after four days without sleep, you start to hallucinate. And all of a sudden, vehicles become monsters. And you're made to lay fat face down in the sand, and there's somebody kicking sand in your face, and they're telling you to quit. My. This is the kind of adversity that is designed for elite purposes. Have you stopped to consider that what you're going through just might be an adversity that is designed to put you in elite category in the kingdom of God. Amen. You have an elite call of duty on your life. And you cannot be elite without pain. You cannot become a great soldier for God without adversity. The process of pain and adversity prepares you and it prepares me for my greatest purpose. So note takers, everyone feels pain, even good people. Pain is something that we all carry. For some, it's body pain. Chronic pain in the body. Pain from an old injury. Pain from simply getting old. There was a comedian who said, he said, I'm at that age now. When I start feeling a pain like in my knee and my hip, I'm like, ooh, that hurts forever. <laughs> For the rest of my life. Well, there's some people that have physical pain in their bodies, maybe a disease, maybe an injury. For others, it's not physical pain. It's a pain in your heart. There's the pain that we carry from criticism. There is a pain from people having feasted on our failures and laughed at our mistakes. There is the pain of betrayal. Somebody that you trusted turned on you. There is the pain of abandonment and abuse. There is the pain of unrealistic expectations and anger that was placed upon you as a child. There is the pain of addiction and bad decisions from your youth. But the word of God informs us that for the believer, turn to your neighbor. Would you do this for me and say to the believer, pain is never pointless. Tell your neighbor, your pain is not pointless. God possesses the genius to take everything in your life and to use it for good. Did you know that sometimes we get mad at God for things that grow us? Have you ever heard the term strategic disappointment? Strategic disappointment. Taking a pacifier away from a two-year-old. Strategic disappointment. Because that's cute when you're two, but it's not cute when you're 22. <laughs> Strategic disappointment. Telling your 18-year-old that they're going to pay their own cell phone bill. Strategic disappointment. Did you know 
that if you don't introduce strategic disappointment to your 18-year-old, they'll be 28 years old and you'll still be paying their phone bill. Telling your 28-year-old to get out of your basement, stop playing video games, and go get a job. Strategic disappointment. Yes, I know you're not happy with me right now, but this is the very thing that's going to grow you and mature you, and maturity is necessary in your life. Something that sometimes the pain in our life is strategic. Yes? What's disappointing in your life could be the very thing that matures you and grows you. There's purpose in your pain. There's purpose in your pain. Let's talk about the purposes of our pain. Can we do that, note takers? Purposes of our pain. Pain can draw you closer to God. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. Oh, yes. I love this verse in Psalm 119. Psalm chapter 119 and verse 67. Can we look at this? This is a great verse. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Ooh, that's good. That's good. You know, sometimes we're so blessed we get outside of God's cell coverage. Sometimes life is so easy, we're, we become distracted doing our thing. And God is speaking and God is calling, but it keeps going to voicemail. Thank you for calling, God, but I'm busy right now. Please leave a message. So God strategically allows pain to touch our lives. And the pain has the power to reroute us back to God's cell coverage. And all of a sudden, we're like, God, we need to talk. I just lost my job, God. That adversity in the church. When we were going through just beautifully through seasons of growth and consolidation and growth and discipleship and, and things are going great and, and we're excited about that. But, but how many of you would say that it's the adversity that really grew you in your ministry and gave you a revelation of God's provision and power and grace in your life? Pain can actually bring me closer to God. Here's something else for you to think about. Pain can make me stronger. I injured my back a while ago. I injured my back, and it was bad. In fact, um, the doctor told me that he would open up the office for me, and it was his day off. And I made it to the front lawn of his office, and I collapsed on the front lawn, and they had to call the medic. And they had to take me to the hospital, and I was in horrific pain. To make a long story short, after I got through that part of the episode, they told me that I needed to go through a regimen of physical therapy. Are there any physical therapists in the house? <laughs> Good. <laughs> so I had a, this physical therapist. She was probably, you know, five foot tall, maybe two or three years out of college. And she was trying to figure out, you know, my range of motion and, and where the limitations were and where the problems were. And she was manipulating me this way and that way. And when she would turn me the wrong way, my back would start to spasm. And I was going, ooh, 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 ooh. And she would say, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Uh, did that hurt? Yes, yes, it hurt. Okay. I won't do that again. I won't do that again. And she was so nice. But over the course of a few weeks, she became Hitler in my life. She really did. And I would be doing these exercises, and sweat would be pouring off of my face, and my knees would be shaking. And she would say, are you feeling a burn right now, right here? Are you feeling a burn? And I'd say, yes, yes, I'm feeling a burn. And she'd say, good, good, that's good. Now, the truth was that the pain was making me stronger. The pain and the resistance was a key to me having true healing and health in my life. The book of Genesis introduces us to a young man by the name of Joseph. And in the beginning, it was all about his dreams. 
But it was not until he felt the burn of betrayal and imprisonment for a few years that Joseph became a better version of himself. He went from being a guy who was self-centered to being a man who served other people's dreams. And instead of focusing on himself, he became sensitive to others. And he noticed even the look of concern on the faces of his friends. And although his life involved extreme testing, it prepared him for an elite purpose. And he saved the known world from a famine and taught the world how to forgive others. So God never wastes a trial. In fact, the very thing that you're most ashamed about in your life, the thing that you most resent about, the thing that happened to you, could become the greatest ministry in your life. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Let's look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. In verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Everybody say enriched. We become enriched. I gave you the wrong verse. Now, I was going to try to just preach that off, but I can't preach that off. It does enrich us, but let me just give you the verse, okay? First mistake I've ever made my whole life. I mean, it's amazing. It has finally happened to me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So the Apostle Paul is saying, after God takes us through the storm, we become guides for others. Amen. That's why I like to pick up the phone every once in a while and call Daryl Johns. That man has been through it, and he pastors one of the charter congregations in our entire fellowship. His choir won How Sweet the Sound, hello, won a national choir competition, but there's so much more to the story than a choir, an apostolic church, a thriving church, a healthy church, but when he took that church, it wasn't that way, and he went through a regimen of adversity and struggle and trials and 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 it was one thing after another and that's the reason why I call that man he's become a guide for my life do you understand that the thing that you're going through could make you a guide for somebody else that's called redemptive suffering would you write that down redemptive suffering Redemptive suffering is when you use your suffering, your journey, your benefit for others. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you. When he died on the cross, he did not deserve to die. He went through that pain for your benefit, for my benefit. Redemptive suffering. So would you please do me a favor? Would you stop acting like nothing's ever happened to you? And we like to go to church and be saved and sanctified. And, but that addiction in our past, we don't like to talk about that. Or that bankruptcy in our past, we don't like to talk about that. Or that time that we almost went to the divorce court, we don't like to talk about that. We need to use our pain to serve somebody else. We redeem our pain when we become a guide for someone else. There's something wrong with it when, as men when we fail to be vulnerable with one another. There are men that come into our churches and they have a full-blown fight on their hand for their soul, their family, their livelihood, their marriage. And sometimes we sit back and we just kind of hope that they're going to do well instead of taking a step forward and becoming a guide and saying, you know, I know what it was like to have addiction in my life. I know what it's like to not have unity in my home. Let me tell you a few stories. Let me pray with you. Let's grow together in the kingdom of God. 
Amen. When you do that, God's purpose outlasts your pain. Amen. I'm just going to shake that tree for a second because I'm just feeling something in the Holy Ghost. For some of us, we are blood washed, but we keep certain things about our story undercover. And I'm not telling you to put something out there that's going to uh, embarrass you or bring shame to your life. But there are some men within the sound of my voice you don't feel that you can use that painful episode or that tragic mistake that you made to help someone else because you are convinced that you still have to forgive yourself. And you haven't forgiven yourself. Could I just ask you, do a Bible study, just undertake this Bible study, and would you please check in the Bible and give me the scripture and the verse where the Bible tells us to forgive ourselves. Show me in the Beatitudes where Jesus ever said we need to forgive ourselves. Show me from the wisdom of Solomon somewhere where we should forgive ourselves. Forgiving ourselves is not in the scripture. In fact, why do we even talk about it in this generation? Because forgiving yourself is what you have to do when you don't have a Savior in your life. And so if, you're, if you want to move on and move past your past, this is how secular humanists would say you have to do this. You have to forgive yourself. In fact, there's a very famous psychologist who said that you are the key to unlocking your future by forgiving yourself. I was never the key to unlocking my future, and I will never be, but Jesus died to forgive me, and if he that the Son has set free is free indeed. The devil wants you to think that there's still another step after God's forgiveness. Who are you to overturn Jesus' verdict when he declares you innocent through his forgiveness and through the washing of his blood? And tell him there's still one more step before you can be whole and complete. Can I just preach for a second and tell you, we need to start celebrating the fact that we are washed, that we are cleansed, that there's not another step that needs to be taken, that God has fully restored us. You're going to be waiting a long time if you feel like you have to forgive yourself. I personally feel like it's a trick of the enemy. To keep you neutralized, paralyzed in shame. Oh, I'd, I'd go forward with this. I'd, I'd, I'd share my testimony, but I haven't forgiven myself yet. I want you to think about how you could actually choose to use your pain for good. Who could you... Could you uh, Use your painful experience. Who, could, who would benefit from hearing your story? Who needs to hear your story? What honor and glory could you give to God in your pain that you're going through right now? A woman in our church had a husband who was feeble for several years. And after he passed away, she began a career of caring for the feeble. She also started a new ministry at our church and built a team to visit the sick and the elderly. The most painful thing that she's ever gone through in her life has become fuel for her journey. It's become a motivation for her life. And you brothers are like a brand new key when you begin your life with no cuts in it. Have you ever seen the key at the hardware store? The keys that are behind the counter. and These keys have no cuts in them. And as you go through life, each wound and each failure cuts into that key. And then one day there's an unmistakable click and your pain has formed a key that slips into the lock and it unlocks your future. You thought you were being deformed. You thought that this pain meant an end of your life. But really the truth is that God was preparing you for an elite purpose. It was molding you. It was carving a key to unlock the door to a better you. Amen. 
I've had experiences in, in my life. I don't mind telling you that there was sexual abuse in my childhood and some distant relative stepped into my world for a brief amount of time and stole something away from me in innocence in my mind. And when you have that experience, your mind is overexposed and underdeveloped. It creates, creates tremendous challenges in your life. I came to have a hatred for that person who hurt me. As I got older, I would begin to think about how I could find that person and even the score. I went to Bible school. Can I tell you, I had bitterness in my heart, and all the while, I loved Jesus. I didn't really have an understanding of, about that bitterness until I was in Bible school, and I was praying one night in the chapel, just talking to the Lord, and having one of those prayers. You know that prayer where you're just saying, God, just use me. I just, want, I just want you to take my life and use my life for your glory. I want to be an extension of your love and your mercy to this world. However you would want to use me, God. And I felt the voice of God. And the Lord just spoke into my heart and said, And what are you going to do with all of your bitterness while you preach about my mercy? And for the first time, it occurred to me that I really needed to forgive that person who had injured me and hurt me so badly. And I confessed that sin, and I laid it down. And if you've ever been hurt deeply by someone, you will know that forgiveness is not just a one prayer episode. It's a journey. It's a journey. But I made a decision to forgive, and I managed that decision from that point forward. And when bitterness would come knocking on my heart's door, I would meet that spirit of bitterness at the door and say, no, I made a decision to forgive that individual and I'm leaving it under the blood and I'm not allowing you back into my spirit, back into my mind. And do you know, as I was consistent about managing that decision to forgive, those visits became further and further apart until the enemy doesn't try to attack me in that area of my life anymore. It's just, a, it's just not an area where he has any advantage in my life. I went to a family reunion a few years ago. And I hadn't been to a family reunion in a long time. And that individual was there. And the moment I saw that individual, I felt compassion. I saw a person I'd been praying for for a long time. And I could tell that person was becoming very uncomfortable because I wasn't just a little boy anymore. That relative went to the extreme side of the park where this whole thing was, this whole family reunion was taking place and sat on a, at a park table a long way away. And I made the walk out to that table and you could see This individual was getting very uncomfortable as I was walking out to that table. But I had a smile on my face. And I slid across the table. And I said, it's been a long time since I've seen you. I didn't confront that individual. If you don't let someone forget it, you didn't forgive it. But what I did do was I just began to talk about how good God was and how blessed my life has been and and, and I just began to just talk about my family and my children. You could see the realization on this face as, as this person was coming to understand that I was communicating to them, I'm doing great, and I'm okay with you, and I love Jesus, and I care about what's going on in your life too. And it was like a thousand pounds was lifted off of this individual's back. You know, that was a painful episode in my life, but I can't tell you how many people I've coached through things like that, who went through situations like that, and helped them to understand that there is such a thing as forgiveness, and it is a journey. And yes, there are episodes in our life where it's not just so easy as one prayer, 
But we've got to make up our mind that forgiveness is the destination. No matter how egregious the offense, forgiveness is going to be the destination. And to coach them along and to encourage them along and to allow them to see wholeness in, in, in their lives. I, if I could hit the rewind button and erase that little moment out of my life, I wouldn't do it because there's power in my pain today. In fact, I would submit to you there is no pain in my life. God has restored me. God has made me whole. Brother, what are you going through? What are you struggling with? What's happening in your local church that's breaking your heart? Before you get angry with God, could you just pause for a moment and consider with me that God possesses the genius to repurpose your pain and if you will hang around long enough, God is going to use that for good. Would you stand with me? This is what I want us to do. I want us to get in circles of four, not more than five men. I want you to talk about what you've heard preached today, that there's power in your pain. I want you to tell the brethren in your circle what you're going to do about it. And then I want everyone in that circle to pray for that individual. And I want you to go around in that circle and everybody take a turn. This is what I heard preached today. And this is what I'm going to do about it. And let's pray with one another. Can we do that?